Now, why is the United States looking at a central bank digital currency? It's looking at a central bank digital currency because it is the reserve currency of the world. They are an empire trying to remain propped up. And so they're going to do whatever they think they need to do. And I think the central bank digital currency will allow them to stay in the game, so to speak, if China and Europe really accelerate with their own digital currency plans. Here at Liberty and Finance, we're licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. We are standing by the inventory, ready to make sure you get what you need, even into the wee hours of night and on weekends, because preparedness doesn't stop. Call us, 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend, Jerry Robinson from followthemoney.com. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always great to be here. Thank you, Elijah. And it's great to have you. You are actually an affiliate, uh, one of our affiliates. So if you go to followthemoney.com, if you like what uh, you've heard today, you can go to followthemoney.com and our promo code uh, to help support Liberty and Finance along the way is just the promo code Liberty. So make sure if you like what you hear today, go sign up there. Uh, so if we could start on probably what is on the top of most people's mind right now is inflation. Your take on what we've been seeing and really how people should be navigating that this at the moment? Well, good question. Uh, inflation is, of course, at a pretty big high, uh, about the forty, about a 41 year high. In 1981 is the last time we've seen this kind of inflation as of the print for uh, May. Uh, that that indicates that, uh, you know, about we're sitting at about eight point six percent in May. Uh, that, of course, is the official inflation rate. Uh, that's not, of course, the the real inflation rate when we strip everything out and we actually use honest numbers. The, the government has been using its CPI numbers, the Consumer Price Index numbers now for many years, and they, they massage those to get the results they want. But they really can't massage them now uh, because no matter where you look, even in the non-food and non-gas prices, inflation is is uh, affecting things. And when we say inflation, we want to make we want to be very careful because – Otherwise, you perpetuate the myth that inflation is created just some sort of some sort of way magically. Like it's it's not uh, a, a, an effect of something. There's actually a cause of inflation, and we write about that in our book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, where we lay out what inflation really is. Inflation is the expansion of the monetary base. So if you pr produce more money, if you produce more in the form of what we would say actually currency in this case with the United States dollar, then you're going to cause, you're going to create this phenomenon where there's too many dollars chasing too few goods. Now that's what we would, many people would say that's the definition of inflation. Well, that's right. Now remember, uh, this inflation, there's a lag effect. So this inflation began, this monetary inflation, if you go and you look at the Federal Reserve website and look at the M2 money supply, for example, You'll notice that this inflation began, uh, well, we've been having an inflationary expansion in the money supply for a long time. But the real staggering uh, monetary inflation began back in uh, tw uh, 2020, uh, right around the time of COVID. And so in March, uh, in April of 2020, in May of 2020, we were seeing these incredible amounts of monetary inflation, just simply breathtaking, incredible amounts of inflation. Now, th this was monetary inflation. This is the expansion of the monetary supply. Now, when you expand the monetary supply, you automatic automatically dilute the value of every one of those dollars. It's the same thing like whenever you have a stock, anybody who owns a stock and then suddenly the company says, hey, we're going to... Uh, have an issuance of more shares. Well, what happens is it's known as share dilution. You, your existing shares get diluted, and so they're worth less. Well, that's the same exact way to think, where it's a very similar way to think about the currency, is when you create more currency to solve a problem, i.e. COVID, then you create monetary inflation. And when you have more money, 
but not more goods per se. You just create price inflation. So we are living in the era of price inflation created by the monetary inflation that began, uh, well, which has been going on for a long time, but that the real big spike came in the wake of the COVID-19 situation. So that was back in March and April of 2020. So now why are we just now seeing all of the price inflation hitting these big levels today in 2022? Because there's something in economics known as a lag uh, effect. So even when the Federal Reserve begins to do something, it raises rates, it doesn't automatically get its intended effect. It takes a period of time for that intended effect to materialize. And so that's the same exact thing here. When, the, when they begin to douse the economy with money, it takes some time for that to trickle out all the way fully into every corner of the economy. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why this is getting worse and worse and worse, even though the Fed is saying, OK, we're slowing down our money printing. OK, we're stopping our money printing. OK, we're raising interest rates. Well, the lag effect is here. Uh, and so it's working. So now it's going to take some time for the current policies that the Fed is implementing, cutting the monetary rate or cutting the uh, uh, monetary expansion, uh, raising interest rates so as to suck in excess dollars in, back into the banking system. This this is going to take time. So it's not immediate. So they don't raise rates and then instantly inflation is over. It, it takes time. So when you print money, it takes time. So when they were printing tons of money back in 2020, that is showing up in our prices today. There's a lag, there's a lag effect. And so what they're doing now is trying to slow it down and it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, will they, will they succeed? Well, we'll see, you know, uh, we'll see if they succeed, but that's really where we're at. So it's important, I think, to make that distinction that inflation, when we use that word, monetary inflation creates price inflation. Uh, price inflation at the store is an effect of the cause known as monetary inflation. The Federal Reserve and to a large extent as well, the uh, Congress and the White House in 2020 bear the responsibility for what's happening today. Even the White House and the Congress today, you know, they're still perpetuating these poor policies. So, yes, um, inflation is real. It's here. It's hard to hide now uh, in the official numbers. But remember, it's a it's an effect of a cause that seems to have no sign of stopping. So we should just prepare ourselves for constant cycles like this, Elijah, where every time there's a problem, expect the Fed to ease. And then eventually you have to burst the bubble. And that's what we're doing. It's a boom bust cycle. It's been going on for decades. Now, you say that it's been going on for decades, and we are seeing this cycle, as you mentioned, this boom bust cycle. The Fed is expanding, and then they're contracting the balance sheet. But where does this end up? Because like, are we just going to see high inflation for years to come, or does this come to a point where this is unsustainable sometime in the future? We're probably towards the end of the experiment. Uh, that's what I would imagine. No one, nobody has a crystal ball. No one knows how long the uh, scam can go on. But there's no doubt that it's a scam. It's a Ponzi scheme. You know, uh, this is how it works. Uh, and so uh, I would say that we should expect higher inflation. We wrote a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation. One of the chapters is, is that why high inflation is coming. You know, why are we going to see high inflation? Well, here we are, you know, 10 years later dealing with, you know, massive inflation. Why? Well, as you pointed out, that boom bust cycle uh, is what creates it. Now, are they going to be able to rein all of this back in and we're going to get back to a regular, uh, normal, quote unquote, inflation rate? Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe it's out of control now. Maybe maybe something has broken. You can certainly see that the age of central bank digital currencies, you can see the move away from uh, the dollar in some segments of the global economy and threats to do the same are intensifying. Uh, you can see that the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia, where we have that very important petrodollar system, that is in jeopardy right now. The White House and Saudi Arabia, you know, in the uh, treacherous time. Uh, and so there's all kinds of things that could put more pressure on the Fed that could totally alter 
its path that it's on right now. So I don't think any of us know exactly when anything is going to happen or how exactly it's going to appear. But I would suspect that the Fed is certainly uh, coming to the realization that its massive fiat currency experiment is getting out of control. And what that is going to ultimately look like, I believe, will be an inflationary period, perhaps even worse than what we're seeing today, followed by, and this is worse, followed by a devastating deflation when the Federal Reserve loses its permission slip to keep printing money at every single time there's a problem. And when they lose that permission slip to keep printing money, i.e. the petrodollar system is broken fully, or whether countries begin to gravitate towards some other reserve currency, then that is the end uh, for the uh, Fed's ability to create a permission slip. And, and I would expect at that point, not to get too dark here, but I would expect that the United States will not go down without a fight. And I literally mean that, that typically when you reach that kind of place where you have deflation and no way out, typically a country will go to war uh, and blame someone else for that. And so I would expect that the United States will ultimately deal with its economic problems by blaming someone else, someone outside of the country, and then proceed to go to war with that uh, country so as to mask what's really happening and to somehow try to dig themselves out of the economic hole they are through war. That's the historical cycle. I think the United States is on that same cycle. Now, how do you think that a possible digital dollar uh, cryptocurrency that the, the Fed would um, issue would play into all of this? Well, I think when you look at the, uh, the, the digital dollar, uh, here in the United States, China really beat the United States to the uh, to this. We've talked about this before, how back in 2014, whenever the world was sleeping on cryptocurrencies, you know, here at Follow the Money, we were buying Bitcoin. We were teaching our members to buy Bitcoin in 2013 and 2012. You know, but in 2014, China, while the world is sleeping on on Bitcoin because it's it's dead, because I think I think Bitcoin has died. I think the latest number is like 457 times. You know, the media has said Bitcoin is dead. Well, back in 2014, uh, China realized this blockchain is fundamentally transformative type of technology that is not going away, kind of like the Internet. They realized that they had to get ahead of this, and they did. So China was the very first major central bank to actually begin really investigating a digital currency. Uh, they were one of the very first countries, if not the very first, to release a digital version of their own currency, the digital yuan. Now, the United States has been uh, kind of uh, sucking its thumb watching all of this as uh, China has been moving ahead in, in blockchain technology. China, by the way, not just blockchain technology. They've surpassed us in drone technology. They've surpassed us in AI uh, technology. They've surpassed us in many different ways, uh, which explains part of the resentment that many people have for China. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't like China, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that, they, that China is, has been really winning uh, pretty big against the United States uh, for, the last, well, for the last many years. And so China is ahead of the curve on the central bank digital currencies. Europe is also moving towards that direction, and the United States is as well. Now, why is the United States looking at a central bank digital currency? It's looking at a central bank digital currency because it is the reserve currency of the world. And if it ignores technology that is emerging around this particular topic and allows and basically cedes uh, the power of this new technology to an emergent power like China, then it risks losing its permission slip that we were talking about earlier. It has a permission slip as the world reserve currency. So the central bank digital currency, no, it doesn't matter what people think about it. People say, well, I don't like it. I don't think it's good, or I think it'll never succeed, or I don't like it. It doesn't really matter what you think. The United States is on a path to not lose its permission slip. So it'll do anything. Uh, whether you think it's foolish, reckless, harmful, whatever, it doesn't really matter. They're not really thinking about uh, that. Uh, they are an empire trying to remain propped up. And so they're going to do whatever they think they need to do. And I think the central bank 
digital currency uh, will allow them to stay in the game, so to speak, if China and Europe really accelerate with their own digital currency plans. The United States doesn't really have a choice is how I, how I view them viewing this. They don't really see themselves having a choice. Now, uh, those who are d- uh, invested in digital assets like we are, you should probably be happy about a central bank digital currency. Many people miss this. It's important uh, if you're a crypto investor to see the United States moving towards this. And somebody might say, well, that that may not be correct, Jerry, because if the United States in- implements its own digital currency, well, then they'll they'll tell us that that's the only one and everybody will just buy that one. But that's not that's not how it works. Uh, I think Bitcoin has been banned six times by by China and many times by other countries. It, Bitcoin doesn't seem to care. It hasn't got the memo. Uh, so it continues to to move on and on and on. So if if Washington unveils a digital currency, Elijah, then what are they doing? They're validating what? Digital assets. They're telling the entire world, hey, digital assets are a real thing. So and so if people begin to use a digital dollar uh, and they're using it and they're seeing, of course, it's losing value over time, uh, they may look at other digital assets that don't lose value the way that the U.S. dollar does. I mean, the U- speaking of stable coins, many people have been talking about the implosion of stable coins. The United States dollar is probably one of the most unstable stable coins that's out there. I mean, look at the inflation rate. Look at the yo-yo uh, price of the dollar over a period of time. It's supposed to be a stable coin, but it's clearly not. So I find a lot of the uh, angst around the stable coins in the crypto world to be lacking in terms of uh, missing the greater picture here of the U.S. stable coin, namely the dollar, which is not stable whatsoever. I think um, digital assets are here to stay, and I think that the United States dollar or the United States uh, government knows this, and so I think that's why they're moving in this direction. It doesn't really matter again what the what we think; it matters what they think ultimately because that will determine their decisions and. And empires typically don't seek out justice. They just simply seek out their own way. And I would expect the United States will do the same thing. What I'm hearing is they're going to introduce the digital dollar because they have to stay afloat and stay uh, relevant uh, with respect to what the rest of the world is doing. Now, when it comes to inflation, what we were talking about at the top of this interview, how do you think this digital dollar Will it impact that? Will it be introduced alongside, you know, our current uh, monetary system and it'll be inflated just the same as the regular dollar is? Or how do you think that'll all uh, play together? Sure, of course. Yeah, the digital version will just simply be a function of the underlying you know, paper version of the dollar. So it's just a it's just a way of doing business with the dollar that makes it that operates on rails that make it more convenient. Uh, lower transaction fees and things of this nature. Now, now many people will point out that the Federal Reserve, they say, well, now the Federal Reserve isn't just simply going to adopt a U.S. dollar because it's con- it's convenient or because it keeps them at the top of the game. They're also adopting it because they want to control everybody. Well, no one's ever debated that. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious that governments like to control. And so if they do issue a, a U.S. dollar that's digital, we have to talk about the incredible amount of fine tuning that this will allow the Federal Reserve to do in its monetary policy. Right now, when they push out money, there's really no way to to, to know where it all is and to force it to move in different directions. Um, they can do it to a certain extent, but with a digital type of ledger, uh, this is going to give them profound control over their policy. And so I think that's another aspect here that we're going to see the United States have more power. I mean, for, for example, um, in China, you know, when they use the digital yuan, they tested out various things where they used expiration dates. So they would perhaps send out, you know, uh, a, a, some digital yuan to the to the population, to so, some segment of the population as a test. But they would 
be able to put expiration dates on it. So here's some stimulus money, but you have to use it by X date. Well, there's no way that uh, you could do that with normal dollars or paper dollars. You couldn't force them to use those dollars because they're always good. They always have to be honored. But with a digital currency, you could actually put an expiration date on when that particular uh, money could be spent. And so this is what I mean is the fact that the Fed will then have much more power in controlling the flows of money through the digital version of the dollar. So, you know, you're certainly going to have more power uh, over the, the currency in that type of situation. Um, and then uh, maybe I didn't answer your full question. Did you have another part of that? Yeah. So how how is this going to play in with the inflation that we're seeing right now? Oh, yeah. It, it really will probably uh, not have too much of a dramatic impact on on it uh, immediately. Um, because again, the, the current inflation rate is already outrageous. Uh, introducing a digital dollar is not, is not an inflationary thing by definition. It's simply a, another way of doing things, but they could probably find ways to manage inflation per, uh, perhaps a little easier with the digital dollar. That's, that remains to be seen. We have to remember that also that we live in a time where where there's a lot of new technologies. If we go back, for example, to the time of electricity, when electricity was first introduced, you know, back in 1880s, and then it actually began to go into people's homes, you know, in the first part of the 20th century, uh, there was a lot of fear. Uh, if you wire my house with electricity, you're going to burn it down, you know. Uh, so people didn't want electricity in their homes initially. Whenever cars were first invented, People considered them death traps. They didn't want to get into a vehicle. You know, they'd rather ride a horse. Um, so you have to remember that when technology and when the Internet came along, uh, remember the dot com bubble and then bursting. You know, how many times was the Internet declared dead uh, after the dot com bubble where you could have bought Amazon dot com stock for fifteen dollars in the wake of the dot com bubble? That was just 20 years ago. You could have bought Amazon dot com for 15 bucks. Right. How many shares do you want? Uh, you could buy, uh, you know, companies like uh, Microsoft, you know, for for uh, you know, for pennies on the dollar in the wake. So you look for these moments when when people give up on brand new technologies and say it's over, it's dead. The count has been done. It'll never survive. That's those are the those are the times in history where you really can make an incredible profit if you're wise. Uh, I don't see the blockchain ledger or digital assets going away as an asset class. That means that if you choose right in the middle of this massacre, that 10, 20 years down the road, it can be very, be very happy for you. Yeah, be very happy. You mentioned how the introduction of the digital dollar will actually be beneficial for these, uh, I guess, decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Now, a lot of people are looking towards cryptocurrency and also there's uh, there's a camp that is looking towards cryptocurrency and there's a camp that's looking towards gold and some people are looking towards both of them um, to protect against the inflation that we're already seeing right now and possibly in the future. Your take on all of that, um, is it cryptocurrency, is it, is it gold or is it both that can uh, protect against inflation? We actually approach this in, in this way. Uh, so every... Uh, we actually take our investable dollars that we have, you know, each month and we divvy them up according to different areas. Uh, so we put in, uh, we dollar cost average into digital assets like Bitcoin, uh, mainly Bitcoin, just a, just a handful of other smaller projects each month. We've been doing that since 2012, 2013, every single week or month, whatever we're, whatever plan we're on at the time. Uh, now, the amount that we put into Bitcoin or these other digital assets, that amount, we actually put in three times that amount into commodities like gold, silver, uh, you know, palladium, platinum, uh, other types of uh, hard, hard assets and commodities. So we are, you know, we are more heavily weighted towards precious metals by a factor of three than we are to digital assets. However, that being said, since 2012, you know, 
even though we've been putting more into precious metals, the amount we put into digital assets has far exceeded the amount that we put into precious metals. So the overall gains obviously have been enormously different. But that hasn't changed our strategy because we realized that we were in on digital assets very early. So it didn't change. And, and I think it's very sad when you see people who go all in. You know, there's a really great quote that I'm thinking of uh, that I can't remember it exactly, but it goes along the lines. It was by Peter Lynch. He said, there's this old thing on Wall Street where if you find something that you don't understand, just put all your life savings into it, you know. And that's, that's what we tend to see is that uh, some people have who were gold bugs – when they saw Bitcoin, they're like, well, gold's dead and silver's dead and all of this is dead. We all have to go all in on Bitcoin. Well, anytime you're going all in on anything, you better be right. You know, and if you're wrong, then you can destroy your whole financial life, your whole financial life. How many people go all in on things that they don't understand? And so we we have a very small amount that we put into digital assets. Some people swear off digital assets. They say they don't want to own them. That's fine. You don't have to own them. So people say, we don't like stocks. You say, well, fine, you don't have to own stuff. Nobody, nobody puts a gun to your head and says you have to buy stocks. Uh, but if you're going to own those asset classes, then you want to take advantage of uh, them when they go down in price, right? So one of the mistakes I made early on was early on in my career, when I, you know, it was like the late 90s and the early 2000s, was I didn't take advantage of some of the downtrends, like there would be massive downtrends and I would get scared and I would move away from the markets. Like if it was gold or if it was stocks or whatever it was, whatever was happening when the market was going down, I would be, Oh no, you know, and I, I would be moved by fear. And then of course, as it bottomed and everybody thought it wasn't going to come back and then it starts curling back up and you're like, I'm not sure. And then it finally starts to rally. You're like, okay, I guess I'll buy some. Well, you just missed, you just missed a great opportunity, right? Because you were scared. And so what, I, what we teach here is that if you're going to be an investor, then you have to choose where you're going to invest and you have to take advantage of pullbacks in those asset classes, you know, otherwise get out. Why are you even bothering to invest? You know, if you're not going to take advantage of prices when they're down, if you're only going to buy assets when they're high, but you're not going to buy those same assets when they're low, then what are you doing? I mean, that's not even investing. So, uh, investing, uh, you know, in, in this space, I think uh, you know gold and silver uh, are not going away because Bitcoin is here, right? They're not going to go away. I mean, they're real things, and silver has a wonderful uh, outlook when you look forward, you know, say, you know, many years. There's just simply no way to explain how you're going to have the demand meet the supply. There's just no way to explain it. Same thing you could probably build the case for uh, with with a few other uh, commodities. Silver is very beneficial in that that level for people who are investing. So if you're an investor. And you're and you're not buying silver when it's you know twenty one dollars or twenty dollars, but you are happy to buy it at forty, then that's not investing. You know I don't know what that is, but but that's not investing. So so investors keep buying whatever they're doing, and they have a, and you would also want to take a portion of your overall investment dollars and decide where you're going to put them, and you keep buying them, right? You keep buying them until either a you have all that you want of that asset, or b you decide I don't want to own this asset anymore. But if you don't take advantage of the pullbacks, then, you know, you're going to really miss out on what investing is all about. Um, so, yeah, I would say gold and silver have not replaced digital assets. We buy, dig we buy uh, commodities at a tune of three to one of what we buy digital assets. And, but we are not swearing off one or the other. We're not saying it's all in on this one or all in on that one. We're not smart enough to know what things are going to look like 20 years from now. Uh, but I would suspect that both asset classes will still be here and they'll both likely be much higher. Now, this year, it's quite interesting how we've seen precious metals being pretty stable um, comparatively compared to the stock market indices. And if we look at Bitcoin crashing, your take on how precious metals have really held their value as opposed to other assets this year? Well, they've struggled. Uh, particularly silver. Uh, silver has struggled. And silver is struggling for a pretty obvious reason. Uh, there's fears of a global economic contraction even deeper than what we've already had. Uh, and that's not good for an industrial metal like silver. So uh, that actually creates, again, an opportunity for investors. So investors have to 
be able to uh, embrace fear, right? They have to be able to embrace fear. I think that silver pulling back to where it has is attractive. Uh, I like silver where it's at. I'm I'm not surprised that silver is where it's at, um, based on many of the factors that we know about the silver market. Um, but when you look at silver in particular, if you look at a chart of silver, uh, one chart that I would say that you really want to pay attention to on silver is the 30 SMA on the daily chart. We, we've been teaching on silver now for you know over a decade, teaching the charts and how, how it works and what, following the trends for our members. Silver uh, right now has uh, been fighting at the 30 uh, simple moving average on a daily chart. It's a very, very important moving average. Uh, so I would say that that area right there, I would watch that. If you're a silver trader or an investor, watch the 30 SMA on a chart. It's pretty interesting how that has played out over time. Uh, right now, gold is trading at right around its 200-day moving average. It's fighting below a declining 50-day moving average. Um, gold, a little more better positioned here in the event that we see a greater economic contraction. Obviously, it's more of a safe haven. Uh, silver could go lower. Uh, especially if we see the market turn l much lower. So the, the stock market recently formed a new long-term downtrend. It took a long time for it to form a new long-term downtrend, Elijah, because it was so bid up, so incredibly stretched to the upside that coming back to a basic mean was, was going to take a bit. And so now we've seen a full-blown long-term downtrend form in the stock market recently. Um, that... Uh, long-term downtrend, if it continues, it could drag down silver prices even further because, again, fear of the overall economy here. That's only going to set up, again, now, that, that doesn't mean, when somebody says that the silver prices may go down, that should excite you. It shouldn't make you run for the hills. It should excite you. Because if you're a long-term investor, that's exactly what you want. You want lower prices. It's very counterintuitive. Most people who are long-term investors they want prices up, but they don't realize that they're buying this stuff, so they don't want to pay high prices. They want to sell it for high prices. They don't want to buy it for high prices. So when it goes down, that's an exciting time for the long-term investor. It's a wonderful time. If silver goes down to, to 10 bucks and stays there for 10 years, I'd be a happy camper because I can buy more of it with my dollar cost averaging. And then when I go to sell it 20, 30, 40 years from now or give it to my kids, it's going to be a heck of a lot worth more. And I will have a lot more of it because it was on sale for so long. It's hard for people to think that way. That's I've been investing and trading for 25 plus years, so I like fear. When people are scared and running around with their hair on fire, that's my happy time. Uh, when people are thinking that things can't crash and it's to the moon, that's my, that's my fearful time. Uh, we just went through that. Uh, I was very cautious, but now we're in a place where I feel a lot better. I like seeing the stock market down at these levels. I like seeing some of these prices. I like seeing Bitcoin down at $20,000. I like it. Some people say, well, it's going out of business. It's going to go away. I, I turn off all that noise. I turn out all the noise and I just keep sticking to my investment plan. And I think over time, uh, you know, it's going to pay off as it already has. All right. Well, Jerry Robinson, we really appreciate your time today. If people enjoy, uh, if people have enjoyed this interview, they can go to followthemoney.com, use the promo code Liberty, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of this interview, uh, to sign up. And did you want to share our viewer, with our viewers a bit about that and any last thoughts you had? Sure. Happy to. Uh, followthemoney.com is a fiercely independent uh, investment and trend research firm. So we, for the last 10 years, actually more than 10 years, we've, we were founded in 2010, We've been helping our members all around the world who want to learn how to invest, want to learn how to trade, or they're already investing and trading, but they're just wanting to get better results. That's what we provide. We provide ongoing education, courses, research, tools, ideas, new trading idea every week, or I'm sorry, a new trading idea sent to you every day. I send out a daily email, like an email newsletter with a new trading idea every single day of the week, um, of the weekdays. And that's something that I would think that many of your members would really benefit from. Most of our folks just love that daily email that has a new daily idea, new tr trading idea with a price entry, a stop loss idea. Sometimes we put out an idea on a gold mining stock. Sometimes we put one out on a silver mining stock. Sometimes we put one out on an ETF. 
a commodity stock. You know, who, who knows? <clears throat> but we are looking for good ideas. We put them out every single day. Plus, our website is just filled with even more ideas and video courses and hundreds of hours of video teachings and audio teachings, PDFs galore. I mean, there's just tons of education here that uh, for anybody who wants to become a better trader, a better investor. And if they join with your with your uh, coupon code, they save uh, uh, you know money, but they also uh, you know are promoting or helping you. Uh, they're helping uh, support you because we give a, a portion of it back to you, as you had mentioned. So uh, that's what it is. Follow the money.com. And if you just want to learn more about us, just sign up for our free email newsletter uh, and we'll uh, we'll put you there. All right. Once again, Jerry, thank you so much for your time and God bless. God bless you, my friend. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.